Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to uh, MZMC's Sunday sitting and talk and discussion. I hope this finds you well. Happy May <clears throat> to all of us. Um, I'd like to start uh, this morning with a, a line from the famous uh, Indian poet Rubin Dranath Tagore that I've been sitting with um, for a couple of weeks. It's kind of turned into a bit of a koan for me, and I want to just start by sharing it with you this morning. The one who plants trees, knowing that he will never sit in their shade, has at least started to understand the meaning of life. The one who plants trees, knowing that he will never sit in their shade, has at least started to understand the meaning of life. Um, strangely enough, this is just sort of me confessing to you my personal response to, to reading this. The place it took me immediately, I, I kind of didn't see coming. I thought, well, that's a nice. It's obviously a beautiful line, it's a beautiful sentiment. Where I immediately went with this was um, kind of a thought experiment, essentially kind of a speculative question I asked myself, if I knew that I would never personally benefit, if I knew that I would never personally reap the fruits of my practice, of my walking of the Eightfold Path, would I continue to walk it? That's where it immediately took me. Would I continue to sit zazen, continue to practice? Um, ethics, would I continue to examine the roots and causes of suffering in my life? Would I continue to face the wall, offer incense like candles? Would I continue to walk the Eightfold Path if I knew I would never reap any of the fruits of that practice? I just think it's an interesting, it's speculative because it's impossible for that to happen, but it's an interesting question. And what it showed me, um, as I, I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised to hear, is my grasping mind, you know, my gaining ideas, as uh, Katagiri Roshi and Suzuki Roshi were so fond of saying, the part of me that's still engaged in um, transactional practice. I'll give you this if you give me that. I'll give you 30 minutes of time on the cushion if you give me a little more contentment, a little more peace, a little more clarity. It really showed me my grasping. It's an interesting question, isn't it? One who plants trees knowing he will never sit in their shade. It's like, That's an interesting idea. So I offer it to you. Um, I'll probably circle back to it a couple of times, but I've been sitting with it for a while and I thought I'd offer it to you in case it shows you something too, you know, about the nature of your practice. Um, but where I wanna to start today is um, I'm gonna steal from um, a friend, I guess, a, a fellow traveler on, uh, on the spiritual path. Um, this is uh, somebody I've come to know just a little bit in some um, work that I've done with the Beacon Hill a uh, friend's house in Boston, it's a Quaker uh, community and I've done um, an offering for them and participated in a couple of their programming uh, things. And so I'm on their mailing list and they send out a little digest, a little kind of newsletter um, every couple of weeks, once a month, something like that. And the woman who writes it, who kind of um, is a bit of the admin organizing presence there at, at the Beacon Hill friend's house is a woman named Jennifer Higgins Newman. And my interactions with her have just been delightful. So I kind of have a face and a voice, you know, to put with the, the little newsletter that we get. And this is what she wrote. Um, I got this, I guess it was two, uh, two mornings ago. She wrote, dear friends, in all honesty, we're sending this digest a day or two later than I'd like to, because I have been having difficulty finding words. I've had many ideas 
for what we might write, but nothing has felt right. I have named my frustration to my colleagues, my spouse, and a few of my housemates. At dinner last night, a new resident suggested to me, perhaps it's not that you have no words, but that you're gaining silence. That reframing away from what I lack and toward what I might be gaining is helping me be okay with this message being short and okay with not having the words. That's it. That's actually all she wrote. There was no message other than I don't have a message. And instead of me imagining that as being a lack of words, I'm gonna offer that to you as a gaining of silence. So I thought of our practice, our Zen practice immediately for what I assume are probably obvious reasons and that we spend an awful lot of time in silence together. And one of the ways of viewing that shared silence is a lack of words. I think it's true to say that there's a lack of words, uh, but it also feels, feels different to me when I frame that as a gaining of silence, a choice. Isn't that interesting? So what I would like to do this morning for just a few minutes, um, I invite you, if you, if you wish, um, to do kind of a thought exercise with me that I hope turns into a non-thought exercise and turns more into a uh, feeling exploration, just a kind of a short experiential that I invite you to uh, join me in exploring. And so what I'd like to uh, invite you to do is um, kind of connect to your posture just for a moment. Some of us have been sitting um, zazen for 40 minutes. Some of us I know are just uh, joining this talk now, but just take a second to kind of connect, please, with your bones and your muscles and how you are choosing to balance those bones. Just take a second, please, to connect to your body. If it is of help to you, and I imagine that it might be, um, you can blink your eyes closed for just a couple of minutes. And I invite you to connect with your breath just to kind of ground and center you. We'll just take a couple of shared breaths together to help us gain some silence. As we're starting to move down into our bodies, I invite you this morning to feel, if you are able, to invite the feeling of your spiritual impulse. Whatever words you use to define what gives rise to your practice, whatever your spiritual practice may be, however you imagine the spiritual dimension of your life. I invite you to just take a moment to see if you can feel that part of yourself, that impulse. Why are you here today at MZMC instead of doing something else? Why have you chosen this morning to put yourself in a religious container? Is there a feeling there that you can find? Can you feel the part of you that aspires or longs or vows If you can actually gain a sense of that, a feeling of that, perhaps explore how large it is. How big is that? Does it have a dimension? 
Does it have any qualities? Is it spacious? Is it sharp? Is there suffering in that part? Or is there only freedom in that part? Does it have activity? Your spiritual impulse? Or is it already stillness? For many of us, that which aspires and that which is aspired to are the same thing. For many of us, that which longs and that which is longed for are the same thing. So it's possible that you've just noticed that part of you is already at peace. That part of you, however small you imagine that part to be, is already content. Part of you is not needing for anything to be different. So I'm wondering this morning if we can feel, if we can apprehend or connect to the part in all of us that does not need anything to be different. And if so, is there a way that we can inhabit that space to become that space. You could take another breath or two. And when you're ready, you can blink your eyes open and kind of come back to <clears throat> Come back to the community here. There's part of us that wants to plant seeds because we want to sit in shade. And there's part of us that already knows we are sitting in shade. There's part of us that knows we don't need to sit in shade in order to experience contentment. And um, Buddhism, especially Zen Buddhism, plays a lot with all of these ideas in lots of different ways. We describe the path as linear. We describe the path as circular. We see how both of those models kind of work at the same time. And sometimes they both seem to fail. The idea of progress, the idea of our practice being a bartering, an exchange with the universe. It's funny to think about Silence is losing words. It's funny to think about silence as gaining silence. You can kind of feel that we have different responses to these ideas, don't we? So in our tradition, uh, we refer arguably uh, arguably, we refer to Dogen, Ehe Dogen Zenji, more than any other uh, Zen teacher in our collective lineage. The monk who's credited with bringing Soto Zen Buddhism from China to Japan and really digging its roots deep into Japanese soil. And um, our teachers who brought this tradition from Japan to America a couple of generations ago in our teaching lineage seem to quote Dogen either almost exclusively or certainly more than any other Zen teacher. One of the things that he said that I read in uh, Tim's blog recently 
is a greatly enlightened person is nevertheless deluded. To understand that is the quintessence of practice. It's a line I've read probably many times over the years. And you know how this is, you, you read it and you go, oh yeah, I got that. And then you forget about it. And then five years later, somebody else quotes it or you read it and you know, something that you're doing. And then you get it at another level, it hits a different part of you, kind of resonates in a different part of your heart. And then, you know, a few years later, you hear it again and it does something else. The greatly enlightened person is nevertheless deluded. To understand that is the quintessence of practice. And then Tim went on further to quote Dogen again, very similar quote, a different language here. Great enlightenment is ever intimate with delusion. Great enlightenment is ever intimate with delusion. Where all this lined up for me is I could see sort of a golden thread between the part of me that wants to gain silence and the part of me that wants to lose words and the part of me that wants to plant seeds and the part of me that wants to sit underneath the tree in the shade, the part of me that is um, experiencing grasping and fear, anger and confusion, the part of me that is defined by the drama, the human drama, the political drama, uh, family drama, cultural drama, collective drama, personal drama, drama at work, drama in my neighborhood. Right, the part of me that wants to push some some things away and wants to pull other things close. The part of me that wants some things to never happen and other things to always happen and never stop. Surely we become intimate with those parts of ourselves when we do Zen practice because it's what we witness when we're sitting in zazen, right? Minute after minute, hour after hour, day after day, year after year. We call this deluded. We call it our karmic self. We call it our ego self. We call it our small self. We call it our human self. Ordinary mind, right? We all have this. We know that once we're born, it's too late. <laughs> we get it. And it's not going anywhere. It's never going anywhere. We just get it and we will have it. And if we're very fortunate at some point in our lives, we feel an aspiration or uh, an impulse to investigate the other part of us. We call it a spiritual part. Um, that spiritual aspiration, that spiritual inquiry has a name in Buddhism. It has several names actually, but the one that comes most readily to mind for most of us would be bodhicitta. Bodhicitta, way-seeking mind, enlightenment-seeking mind, the part of you that recognizes, yeah, I'm, I'm human, and I have dukkha, and grasping, and greed, and delusion, and aversion so strongly. And there also seems to be another part of me. There also seems to be another dimension to life. What is that? What is that? Right? This is what causes Buddha to leap over the palace walls and begin his, begin his quest in the myth, right? The part of you that wants to go, hold on a minute, there's something more going on here. What is that thing? You must have it or you wouldn't be at a Zen center on a Sunday morning, you know, spending time sitting in silence observing your body, observing your breath, trying to bear witness through humanity, grabbing and pushing, and twisting and wringing, wanting so badly to sit on the shade. You must know this because you're, you're here today doing just what I'm doing. You must feel some version of this same aspiration. You share it, right? Bodhicitta. So this idea of intimacy with delusion ever intimate with delusion. That Dogen said feels like such good Zazen instruction to me. I don't know how this morning's sitting was for all of you. We all had different sittings. I'm guessing there's some similarity. Perhaps on one level, we all had the same sitting in that we probably noticed trauma, grasping, pulling, pushing, wanting, Discontent, storylines, narratives, agenda. It's what, it's what humans do. We sit down as humans and there it is. We watch the human experience. We watch all of that unfold. 
but our invitation and our practice is to watch it in a very particular way. To watch it from that place of spaciousness that we already really are, certainly we all have, that place that aspires to meet the human experience with kindness, understanding, acceptance, tenderness. In our tradition, we say to try to meet it with compassion and to try to meet it with wisdom, right? Our enlightenment, being intimate with our delusion. Sometimes we call it the witness. That's what we're cultivating on the cushion, right? When we're doing our zazen, we're cultivating, right, I'm the watcher. Right, I'm consciousness. Right, I'm the boundless field. I'm the uncultivated field, right? Right, that's what I am. I am bodhicitta. I'm Buddha nature. Yes, free, unfettered, already content. It's okay. Watching the part of me that imagines that it's lacking, that it's needing. We remember and we come back and we remember and we come back over and over, right? That sounds like Sazen. Like this is Sazen, right? The greatly enlightened person is nevertheless deluded. <laughs> These are not two different things. Enlightenment is not the absence of delusion. And delusion is not the absence of enlightenment. It's a tough teaching for us. We hear it over and over and over and over in Soto Zen Buddhism, over and over. Dogen says that in a thousand different ways, a thousand different times. All of our teachers have said that a thousand different ways, a thousand different times. And it's very, very hard for us to overcome that split, that idea, right? That that which is longed for will bring contentment when it eventually arrives. It's so hard to not believe that. So much of our experience, when we only examine it on the surface, seems to reinforce that idea, right? We bring delusion to the cushion, and if we refine it, and if we're really, really good, if we're really, really faithful Zen students, maybe someday, yeah. It's a very compelling idea. It certainly motivates my practice an awful lot more than I wish it did. Motivated my practice for the first at least two decades of sitting, of course. Regardless of the fact I was hearing the same teaching over and over and over and over. It's a very, very tough split to overcome. Enlightenment is not the absence of delusion. The implications of that for our practice are still wildly radical. 800 years after that teaching was given in the case of Dogen and much, much, much longer after the first times this teaching was given. Delusion is not the absence of enlightenment. Delusion and enlightenment have no fixed nature. They are separate, but they are not divisible. They are like two sides of the same coin. That's how our teachers talk about it. In Tim's blog recently, he wrote, our primary meditation practice is to shine an unwavering light on each of our delusions. The ability to shine our light of awareness on a delusion with absolutely no judgment is already enlightenment. When you kindly hold your frailties like a wounded bird or an animal that you love, you see that enlightenment is always intimate with delusion, which also means enlightenment is also always present, which somehow also means the planting and the sitting in the shade are the same activity and that the losing words and the gaining silence are one thing. I like his metaphor of the wounded bird or the animal that you love, because that awakens in us those images. Well, they awaken in me kindness, compassion, right? They just awake, they, they awaken in me a very natural desire to want to connect. And that seems important to me because when my delusions arise on the cushion and I notice my greed and I notice my grasping and I notice my anger and I notice my judgment and I notice my sadness and I notice my confusion and I notice my cruelty and I notice, right? My initial impulse is not to hold those things or to connect to them. My initial impulse is to turn away from them, to disown them, to deny them, to skip over them, to not feel them, to not acknowledge them, to not investigate them 
recognition of those qualities in me generally don't create curiosity, inquiry, the desire to investigate, compassion, wisdom. That's exactly the invitation. <laughs> That's what every teacher I've ever had has over offered to me over and over and over all these years. And yet still, that initial impulse is, <gasps> I don't know. Do you feel it? I know you do. I know you do. So we give ourselves the same talk again. We remind ourselves of our impulse again. We re-expose ourselves to the same teaching again. And we think of another way of talking about it. Let's compare it to um, an animal that we love. Let's compare it to something that's wounded and hurting. Let, let's use some sort of simile, some sort of metaphor, some sort of parable that helps us remember that we get to respond to suffering with compassion and we can turn toward those things with a desire to be intimate with them. Enlightenment is intimate with delusion. I never need to ask this to go away. I never need to ask this to go away. That's why Dogen's word choice is so profound, ever intimate. What's woven in there is delusion's not going anywhere. Suffering's not going anywhere. We inhabit bodies. We inhabit humanity. The nature of humanity is dukkha. It's many other things, but that's one of the things, right? First noble truth. Please don't disown this. Please don't judge this. Please don't need this to leave, to wait, to be contented some other time. Other time never shows up. So here we again have our oft-repeated eternal refrain. Can you be okay with it? Can you hold it? Can you be intimate with it? Can you make your zazen even more tender, even kinder than it was before? Can you do that? Can you connect with it? We have a beautiful model in the Buddhist tradition that um, I wish I knew more about. I think it has layers of meaning that I, that I don't grasp, but we have a model for um, connection in the senses called the Datus, uh, D-H-A-T-U-S. There's 18 of them in the Buddhist model. You can, you can um, internet search this and, and learn more about it probably than I will ever know, the 18 Datus. And it talks about uh, all of our sense organs and then sense objects, and then, the con and then the consciousness that connects the sense organ to the sense object. So for example, my eyes are a sense organ, and then an apple, if I'm seeing an apple, that's an object, and then there has to be consciousness, seeing consciousness that connects my eyes to the apple in order for the thing that I call seeing to happen, right? So there's the realm of the organ, the realm of the object, and then the realm of the consciousness that connects them. There's three of the datus. So there's seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching, and then mind. You kind of get it. Oh, six senses times three is 18, 18 datus. What I like about this model is that seeing consciousness or hearing consciousness or tasting or touch, it's touch. It's touch. I mean, I'm touching the apple. I'm not touching it the way this sense organ does skin. Nevertheless, the connection is actually connection. It is intimacy with, it's touch, right? All of the senses are touch. That's just one way of looking at them, one way of kind of describing them. To hear the bird call is to touch it, to be touched by it. In other words, we're talking about this. We're talking about touching, intimacy, connection, not identification with, I'm not confused when I hold an apple that I am the apple. I'm not confused by that. I'm the holder of the apple. But I also can feel it. I'm touching it. This isn't abstract. I'm having an experience. Right? I invite myself to do the same thing with my drama. With my drama. With the drama that I experience inside of my human body, inside of my human heart. The drama that gets activated in me with my grasping and my greed and my hate and my aversion. The drama that gets triggered in me from my family and my culture and politics and religion and my neighborhood and the world. It activates, it activates. <gasps> and it stirs into motion and then there is conflict and there are parts of me that are at war with other parts of me and ideas that are at war with other parts of me and all those things want to be acted out. They create tension in me that wants to do something. I want to project those things out. I want to, you all know this. You, you see it the same way I do. Like, oh, the world was so peaceful. And then I read my newsfeed and now the world isn't safe. 
wow, drama, right? I know that that's projection. I know that's just me. That's my humanity. That's my suffering. That's my dukkha, of course. And I have this thing called Zen Buddhism that says, can you hold that? I'm not saying deny it. I'm not saying scold it. Don't ask it to leave. Can you hold that? Can you hold that with real kindness, genuine understanding? Oh, I see how you came to be. I see exactly how you came to be. I know the origin of an apple because seeds were planted and a tree grew. I understand how that came to be. I get my own reactivity around stuff that happens in this world. Can I hold it with tenderness and yet still not need to identify the entirety of myself with it? Is it possible? And of course, Zen says, yeah, it's possible. It's literally what we do every single day during the ritual we call Zazen. We bear witness. We don't identify with. That's why when we notice we're caught by our drama, we go, oh, I notice that I'm caught. I'm going to go back to just illuminating. I will be intimate with the drama. I'll illuminate it. I'll illuminate it with my watching. I'll illuminate it. I will not look away but I will not identify with it. This is the dance, the dance of Zazen that Tim was talking about in his blog, that Dogen was talking about, that the Buddha talked about when he taught mindfulness. Wow, what an opportunity. Do you feel our freedom? And do you feel the way that the part of us that is free wants to rush toward the part of us that feels bound to offer it some comfort? The part of us that is spacious wants to rush toward the part of us that feels claustrophobic and trapped, right? The part of us that is already content and doesn't need anything to be different <gasps> rushes toward the part of us that imagines that it does, that imagines that it's lacking, right? This is our Buddha nature, great enlightenment. We already have. Is always willing to be intimate with delusion. Isn't that interesting? We just witness. We just witness. <sighs> so I want to start to wrap up here. I think what I'm inviting myself to know, and so I'll offer it to you in case you need to hear it, is we get to relax. Just relax. <laughs> pay attention. Just relax and pay attention. Sounds like Sazen, right? Just relax and pay attention. That's all. That's all. Because despite all there is to do, there's actually nothing to be done. Right? Do you feel the paradox there, how those are both true? So much to do, but nothing to be done. Right? Seeing, our seeing through the lens of our compassion, through the lens of our wisdom, through the lens of love, that transforms what's seen. Everybody knows that. The way we see transforms what we see. Seeing clearly, as Tim said, without judgment, without grasping, without needing it to be different, without greed, without hate, right? That's already participatory. It's touching, right? It's already participatory healing action. That's it, right? The witness doesn't actually even need to do anything. Have you noticed that? Like Buddha doesn't do anything. Buddha doesn't do anything. Doesn't need to do anything. He doesn't really interfere much with this whole thing that's happening that we call the human drama, because the whole thing already is Buddha. It already is. So there's just the witnessing. There's just the holding. Great enlightenment has always been presence, present. It's never been absent. It's just intimate with the delusion. It just holds it. it doesn't need to do anything. It holds it all. Right? This is what heals. We know this because we long to be witnessed this way. All of us desperately long to be witnessed through the eyes of love, complete acceptance, non-judgment, absolute understanding, intimacy all the way down every little part of ourselves. We long for that. We can imagine how healing it would be to have someone bear witness to us that way. We already know this. We already know that to be seen that way would in and of itself be healing. And so we long for it. And so we hope that somebody else will show up and do it for us, a partner or a teacher or a religious figure or something. 
So we know all these truths, everything that I'm saying, everything that Tim wrote, everything that Dogen wrote, everything my friend Jennifer wrote, <laughs> it's all stuff we know, we all know this. That spiritual impulse that you obeyed this morning or 10 years ago or 50 years ago when you very first picked up a book on going to church or synagogues or mosques or you sat zazen or you went to mass or you looked up into the night sky and wondered, right? We've known it the whole time. We start to run out of things to say. We do gain silence. That's why we're so quiet. We start to know everything is already connection. It's already happening. It's already done. It always has been done. All is well. It always has been well. Or as the great uh, Christian mystic Simone Weil said, if we go down into ourselves, we find that we possess exactly what we desire. Right? Seeds and trees already here. Well, I thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I think this was the talk that I needed to hear, which is probably why I gave it. So if it's of any value to you, I am grateful. And I'm happy about that. But um, that's as much as I think I need to say today. So thank you. And um, I'm happy to turn it over to you. If you've got questions today or comments or things you'd like to share, share experience about any of this stuff, that is A-OK. -okay. And at some point, um, our morning dawn will take things over and make a bunch of announcements that need to happen.